And this is part of the colloquium series from the William Allison White Society. But tonight is a very special night because this is, this is the evening that is dedicated to the Harry Stack Sullivan Society. And therefore, I would like to introduce you to the president of the Harry Stack Sullivan Society, Elizabeth Crimendall, who will introduce our speakers tonight. Elizabeth. Good evening and thanks for coming. I'd like to begin by thanking several people. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Tina Harrell, Tina, how are you? Um, who's the head of the colloquium committee, for being so welcoming to candidates and for allowing us such free reign in designing this evening's program. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Bob Watson and the Psychoanalytic Society, the White Psychoanalytic Society, who are our co-sponsor for the evening. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to thank Dr. Toby Klass, who initiated our contacts with Dr. Havens. We're pleased to present what promises to be a very exciting program. Dr. Havens is giving a paper entitled, Difficult or Easy Patient, What Do We Mean? And Dr. Don Stern will be the discussant. In his paper, Dr. Havens reformulates the way we think about difficult and easy patients. In his redefinition, patients are difficult or workable because of the match between the kind of response they need from the analyst and the kind of response the analyst is characterologically equipped to give. Difficult patients are the people we can't reach to meet. His view derives from a lifetime of fascination with the clinical talents of very special clinicians, people who had particular talents with particular kinds of patients. One of these clinicians was Harry Stack Sullivan. In his discussion of the paper, Dr. Stern offers some personal recollections about the years at the White Institute, the 1970s, during which Dr. Havens was here for the first time. He describes Dr. Havens' view as analysis as doing, more than analysis as knowing, and identifies Dr. Havens' perspective on the difficult patient as a contribution to the understanding of relational effects in therapeutic action. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Leston Havens. Dr. Havens is a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and the co-director of education at Cambridge Hospital, which is affiliated with Harvard. He's also the author of numerous books and papers, his personal favorite being Approaches to the Mind. Dr. Haven's books have come out of his efforts to teach himself aspects of psychological and psychiatric schools of thought. He's been primarily interested in the differences between schools in terms of perspectives and methods. Early on, he realized that the existential and interpersonal schools had not been as fully developed as some others, and he set out to remedy this. He's written several books that specifically develop interpersonal methods. He began with the book Participant Observation, which, appropriately enough, is about Harry Stack Sullivan. He then continued with Making Contact, which he feels is his most comprehensive book. And A Safe Place was next. Most recently, the book, Coming to Life, exemplifies methods in action. So on behalf of the candidates of the White so and the White Society, I am pleased to present Dr. Leston Havens. That was, an, that was an extraordinary introduction. Um, the, the thing about it that was most remarkable is it makes it unnecessary for Donald and me to say anything further. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to worry about you, my dear. <laughs> but that will, not, that will not stop Donald and me from saying something further. Neither one of us. <clears throat> Now, as our, as our good introducer has indicated, I want to <clears throat> talk about the problem of ease and difficulty clinically in terms of, of uh, as she says, characterological, what, I would, what, I would, what I'm going to call who you are. Uh, who you are. Um, I, had, uh, I, I had hoped that Edgar Levinson would be here tonight. Hi, Jerry. <laughs> I had hoped that Edgar Levinson would be here tonight because I'm... I, I, uh, well, I'll go ahead with my uh, beginning, even if he's not here, because he, uh, I, wrote a, I wrote a piece for the Psychoanalytic Psychology Journal, <coughs> a review essay of, of two books that came out of your society 
the handbook of interpersonal psychoanalysis and pioneers of interpersonal psychoanalysis. I wrote this essay about those two books, those two extraordinary books. And uh, in it, I found uh, something I should have known already, but I found there, although he had done it earlier, Levinson had done it earlier, in which he, say, he equated successful, as you know so well, he equated successful uh, therapeutic work with what he called changing the inner and outer interpersonal field by means of the therapist's resisting transformation. Resisting transformation, which he called boring from within. Boring from within. I love that that expression because when I was <coughs> a candidate in the Boston Institute, I asked Greta Biebring, who was the high priest of Boston analysis at that time, high priestess, uh, <coughs> although if you knew Greta Biebring, you would have said that, you would have said the same thing, that uh, <laughs> <laughs> who, is, who, who is the great Israeli prime minister, the lady, what was her name? Well, go, go, remember they used to say about Golda that she was the only man in the cabinet. Right? <laughs> and uh, anyway, I asked Greta Biebring at one point how analysis worked, because it seemed to me that the metapsychological principles of analysis made it impossible for it to work. That interpretation could not deal with unconscious factors, etc. I said, you know the arguments. And uh, she said to me, she said to me. Um, the big thing, I wish I could, I wish I had a Viennese accent. I'd be able to charge much more than I do. <laughs> she said to me, the great thing, the great thing is to bore the neurosis to death. <laughs> now, that is not what Edgar Levinson means. <laughs> I mean, most, most seriously, that is not what he means. He means something which is, uh, which is less clever than that and more profound. What he means, I think, is that, that he hopes, and I'm sure it's only a hope with most of us, uh, he, he hopes that we will be able to enter the interpersonal field, the transferential poles and all that, and not be pulled out of shape ourselves, that we will be constant enough to ourselves, to who we are, so that we're able to introduce into that field something which is, which is not so malleable, something which can be used to, for, the pers the, for the patient's uh, gain. So that's how I get to this business of uh, who you are. Because although <coughs> he implies, I think, maybe somewhere else he develops it, but he implies that we know what we mean by who you are, uh, on the whole, it's, it's an undeveloped territory in much of our work, and, and it's that I want to talk about tonight. <coughs> I'm going to do it by pursuing what has been, as, as your introducer indicated, has been a long-term scholarly and, and uh, research effort of my own, which is to figure out or find out how people actually do their work, how you go about the work. And one reason for needing to do that is very few of the most intuitive workers know how they do it, because they just do it. That's who they are. And two of the people I'll talk about tonight, that was extraordinarily true of Sullivan and my own teacher, uh, Elvin Semret of Boston. They, they just were themselves. They, they uh, just were there. And, uh, and, and if you ask them what they were doing, in Elvin Semret's case, I could do that, I would get a standard response not so different from Greta Biebring's. And, um, but in fact, that wasn't the way the person worked. <coughs> first about Sullivan. <coughs> when, I, when I came here the first time to speak, it was with considerable apprehension. I have some apprehension right now, as you can see, but I had even more apprehension than that, if it's possible. The, um <coughs> and that was because I'd written a book explaining what Harry Stack Sullivan actually did in action, what, what, what his clinical doing, as you put it so well, involved. And um, unfortunately, immediately after, almost immediately after the, my book was published, a book that you all, probably, most of you know, the Cranes and Parloff book, was published uh, on the supervision that Sullivan did of a schizophrenic case. So they have the most detailed account of his interventions following my account. <laughs> So I, I read that book, 
um, with, as, a, as you see, great concern, but I was happily surprised to feel I thought it did confirm uh, what I had said, which was a kind of independent thing, which gave me perhaps even more courage about that than I should have. But nevertheless, I didn't know whether you people would think that way at all. So when I uh, came to talk about it, I, I, was, I was quite frightened. And uh, I got a, you let me away, you let me out of here without tar and feathering me, but you, what God knows what you may have said behind my back. <laughs> now Sullivan, as, as you know very well, and perhaps better in some ways than I do, Sullivan was, was an adept, was, had a genius for dealing with paranoid p people and paranoid situations. And that was one of the very first things that, <clears throat> that interested me about him. Uh, how could he do this? Your, your old friend Ralph Crowley, who was a, also a, not a close friend, but a friend of mine, a man I immensely admired, um, told me a story about, about uh, Sullivan and paranoia, which stuck in my mind. Um, he remarked that in private mental hospitals in within the area of influence that Sullivan had, private mental hospitals would sometimes call up Sullivan and have him come in if a patient in the hospital got much worse. And usually where they got worse, they got paranoid. <coughs> now, you want, we all know that that is a rare occasion that they call up for help because one of the great joys of having a patient get worse, particularly in an expensive private mental hospital, is that, is that you can always tell the family or yourself that you've discovered how really sick the person is, right? That one does not tend to think that one might have done something awful that would have made anybody paranoid under those circumstances. But once in a while, you can imagine the kind of situation that would call forth the need for old Harry Stack. Say, it, say the patient was the favorite son or daughter of the chairman of the Board of Trustees. And say the, that the chairman of the Board of Trustees was a reasonably uh, intact human being who, who didn't take easy answers to the difficulties his kid was having with this hospital staff of his, right? So they would have to do something quietly and quickly to make sure that, uh, that they weren't in hot water with the boss. And that was when they'd call up Harry Stack and, and he'd come in. This, by the way, is, as many of you know, is a common medical intervention. I took care of a, a brilliant urological surgeon for many years, who modest, quiet man, who used to be called up and brought in at night to the Peter Ben, I shouldn't say where it was, but, uh, <laughs> to one of the one of the hospitals, and when the professor of urology had been mistakenly cut the ureters of one of the richer patients, and something had to be done about it quickly, and they would bring him in at night, and he would uh, sew him up, and, and and the lawyers wouldn't get there in time to do much about it. <clears throat> But that was, the, that was the way they brought Sullivan in somewhat secretly. They didn't like him. They didn't like this dependence, but they brought him in. And you probably know what he did. <coughs> and it's, il it's illustrative of what he did with patients. Uh, he did, he, they would start to give him the history of the case, and he would stop them. <laughs> he didn't want the history. He called the histories that, that are in the in the records of mental hospitals or anybody else's records for the most part. He called them wonderful works of clinical fiction <laughs> because he knew that most of us don't know how to take a history in such a way that it might have some vertical importance. Right? And uh, so he stopped the discussion at that point. He'd say, no, no, don't, don't tell me the history. Tell me what you said, what the patient said, what you said, the patient said. Get me the dialogue. And then he would routinely say, well, you don't talk right and he would tell them how they should talk. Well, it was out of the collection of those kinds of incidents and, and others I heard about that I deduced some part of what, uh, what Sullivan did in action. And uh, uh, I call it counter-projection. And just let me say a word about that because it, it not only is it, a, his, not only was his intuitive sense of how to do this enormously useful in clinical situations. But it also, in my opinion, is the only experimental uh, test demonstration of a psychoanalytic conception ever, ever discovered. You know, we take a terrible beating from our scientific colleagues because we can't prove anything. So I, so I attach great importance to the fact that, that doing counterprojection demonstrates that perhaps 
the analytic view of projection and, and paranoia is correct. One of the analytic views. You, you may or may not remember, but, but what I meant by counter-projection was that, that Sullivan would have the interviewer or the therapist sit beside the patient so they don't stare at each other because that immediately generates paranoid thoughts in anybody when you're being stared at, especially, especially by a highly paid and important therapist. The, um, second of all, he suggested that they direct attention in their conversation away from themselves outside to the social field, which of course he thought was where the problems lay. And then thirdly, he suggested that they speak with some of the same ferocity about those enemies of the patient that the patient had already expressed. You could call this empathy with rage. Now, empathy with rage, <coughs> empathy with rage is not a popular thing. Empathy with anxiety is, empathy with sadness is, but empathy with either love or rage, love or hate, are not things that our profession has by any means uh, adapted as a, as a safe, proper course of action. Anyway, that's what he suggested. So he would, uh, he would um, have, the, have the therapist sitting or standing beside the patient, expressing with some real fury what the world delivered to this individual. And, uh, and, uh, and that had quite, quite predictably, not invariably, but quite predictably, the effect of reducing the paranoid phenomenon. I used to test this in the emergency rooms of hospitals I worked in. The police would bring in a, a patient who was beating up the beating up the population and, and broke up a few bars and was furious and, and one marvelously marvelously articulate about the horrors of life and they would take five or six policemen and, and then if I could get myself on their side standing both of us against a wall we would look at the police and I don't know how you feel about the police but I had enough of a 60s virus to feel that one could look at them with a yeah, with a, what is it, a jaundice or unjaundice or whatever it is, I, and, and, uh, <clears throat> and so he would express some of the same feelings about the police. And by the way, the police don't mind this at all. They're, they're, they're used to it. And, uh, and, then, and then in the course of that, uh, the paranoid manifestation would, would seriously diminish and you could get the patient upstairs without having to tie them up in ropes and, or give them a lot of Thorazine immediately or something of that kind. So I convinced myself that this was a significant thing. But notice the beauty of it, please. Notice the beauty of it intellectually. Because here we were most of the time saying that projections are a function of unbearable affects which burst asunder the containing mechanisms of the psyche and cause the projection outward of some bolus of hostility which is put on the world and then experienced back. Some idea like that in various different formulations is commonplace to our analytic thinking. Well, here was a device by which sharing the feelings, and share means to divide or apportion. So as you know so well from empathy with, with sadness and anxiety, you get anxious when you're doing it if you do it right, or you get sad when you do it right. So that this reduction of feeling makes the inability to contain the hostile projection less, and so it can come back in to the mind. And then, most beautiful of all demonstrations, very often after you have successfully counter-projected a paranoid person, that person becomes depressed. And that's what's predicted in the, in the model, because it doesn't go away. It comes back in and then attacks you, yourself, and produces a depressive phenomenon. And uh, it's the only experimental demonstration I've ever been able to cook up or ever read about from anybody of, an, of a basic analytic proposition. Now, what has this got to do with who Sa Harry Stack Sullivan was? How come he took naturally to this? <coughs> now, here, let me speculate. But I speculate on the basis of Oh, what a book I regard very, very highly, the, uh, port, the Psychiatrist of America by Helen Swick Perry, the first half of which is a Thomas Hardy quality evocation of the extraordinary experience of this Catholic Irish boy in an upper 
New York Protestant community, poor boy, and what it was like to experience the force of unfriendly institution. It, um, those of you who don't know the, that book, and I don't, can't imagine there are many of you here who don't, but really should read it and, 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 and enjoy what, what is a really a Thomas Hardy-esque gift of ev evoking that atmosphere. He uh, uh, published by, by the way, by the publisher of that book was, was uh, Arthur Rosenthal, whom known to many of you here. Um, it was at that time head of the Harvard University Press and it was a great friend of the white and has published, as you know, many books by the most famous recent one, I guess, is the Greenberg and Mitchell Marvelous Compendium of Psychological, of psychological Schools. <clears throat> so I suggest to you that, that Sullivan had an experience of institutional persecution, if you like, or a distrust of institutions from a very early age. Now that would not have made him an effective person. It could have made him a very paranoid person and there's some suggestions of the, at various times he perhaps was. But when, we, when he reached that point where he became, I think, the principal genius of American uh, psychoanalysis, psychiatry, and perhaps psych clinical psychology as well, but he had mastered that feeling and he had begun to think about the way in which institutions and individuals relate, and he had developed an intuitive way of dealing with paranoid people that, that normalized their, their responses and their behavior. And, I think, it, and I, I think the reason that he never described this, even though he did it, never thought of it as a distinct method of his own, look through the, psych, look through the uh, psychiatric interview, for example, to find, try to find an inkling of something like this in it. I can't. The reason he didn't was that it, it was him, it, he did it, it was he, who he was, that bubbled directly out of him and, and gave us this gift, this wonderful gift. And those of us who have been around since he died, you know, in the how many years now, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, have had a great lesson in the perfidy and horror of institutions, have we not? Have we, have, I mean, there was a time when if, a, if someone said to you that the CIA was reading your mail, you would be accused of, right, some kind of paranoid statement. Nowadays you have to say, well, does it only read yours, you know? <laughs> so he was a forerunner in the understanding of the nature of, of institutional life and of the possibilities of perfidy and, and destructiveness from institutions toward individuals. And we can be thankful that he had the gift to, to take that intuitive understanding and find clinical ways to deal with it that are, uh, that are so effective. Elvin Samrad was a very different person. In some ways they were opposites. In some ways they were similar. Um, Samarad was, was not a combative person at all. He was a generally meek man and somewhat depressed man. He took upon himself the burdens of the world. He didn't try to deal with them in the directness that was such a wonderment in the mind and efforts of Harry Stack Sullivan. Um, but he, he did magic you know, of, the same, of a level comparable to Sullivan. I, I know that because I was subjected to the humiliations that it involved. Um, when I was a resident, and like all eager young medical residents, I was my main self, my main charge on myself was to find everything possible. I, I, my, my charge was to find everything possible to matter with the patient. If you've, if you've ever led the life of a medical intern, you know that the one thing you fear most is not the death of the patient, not the poisoning of the patient, not the overcharging of the patient, not the neglect of the patient, none of those things. The thing you fear is that the, that the next person up, the assistant resident or the full resident or the professor, God forbid, should discover something, about the, something wrong with the patient that you missed. That's the, that's the, uh, that's the hell of, uh, of the mental life of, of being a, a, a young person in the medical system. So when I got through, and I was as eager, if not more eager than most of the other residents, <coughs> I got through, 
the most ordinary law-abiding and decent human citizen in the world could come forth looking like a perfect monster. And it was no hard. It's not very hard. All our terms are so flexible and so unboundary that you can do it with anybody. And we do, I know we all do it in domestic arguments with each other all the time. <laughs> But here I would have I would have produced this psychological monster, and and the the patient would come in and sit down next to Elvin, and the two of them would in a few minutes, sometimes longer, but a few minutes, and not invariably, but often enough to so it was remarkable, would be put their heads together, and they'd be talking to each other like they'd known each other all their lives, and they'd be talking not about the weather in Boston or some such. The topic is that, but about the most heartfelt concerns, their losses, their disappointments, the rest. But they'd be talking head to head, frankly, honestly, sensibly, articulately, consistently to each other for a long time. Now, where was my monster? Where had my monster gone? At first, I thought it was a trick that Yale was playing on Harvard. <laughs> There's every reason to believe that it could be a trick. Because <laughs> a Harvard graduate student, some of you know this story, once went down and got hospitalized in the Yale Psychiatric Institute. A Harvard social relations graduate student went down there ready to write their thesis. You know, with, and the only person that knew about it was the professor of psychiatry at that time <clears throat> at Yale. And this individual, camouflaged, was part of the patient population at Yale. So I've been waiting for years for somebody to come back. <laughs> But that, but that sensible hypothesis had to be abandoned because it ha because Elvin could do this too often, too often, and, and there was every reason to believe it shouldn't happen. If the patient was psychotic, we were told that this was a very difficult thing, in, in, in perhaps even unre unremovable. Um, the analytic theory was it involved profound regression, primitive defenses, you, you know, all those things. And, and the biological theory involved brain atrophy, terrible problems with catecholamines, all kinds of dire things of that kind, which obviously a simple conversation with a Czech ethnic from Nebraska named Semerad was not going to remedy, right? <laughs> but he had remedied it. He had remedied it. And um, the patient didn't always go on that way, probably because they weren't still talking to him, but there were other things obviously involved. But it, it had happened at all was something that puzzled me immensely and was one of the reasons for my starting on this voyage of understanding existential and interpersonal work. <coughs> now, Samrad was a simple man. If simplicity is simple, which it probably isn't, he was, a, he, was a, he, was a, he was a quiet man, he was a decent man, he was most unlike most of his colleagues or me or other, most of other rest of us even in his directness and simplicity and humanity you know he was a man who, who liked to say about interpretations he didn't say it he said it quietly <laughs> not in the hearings of his colleagues because I, I had my office next to him for 15 years so I heard a lot of things muttered and uh, <clears throat> he said that if you have to tell somebody something this is his comment about interpretation if you have to tell somebody something it's already too late hmm? And so it wasn't by telling people that he did it, it was by who he was, who he, his being, as the existentialists say, his being. And he wanted to be able to bring that being to bear. And he could do that by a level of engagement that was, seemed simple, but obviously involved a, a willingness to expose himself. And um, so that his being able to do this particularly in the, in the Boston environment, the Harvard environment in which he worked, must have been an extraordinary struggle for him. And we'll come back to that, to that moment. And again, just as it must have been an extraordinary struggle for, for Harry Stack to, to be able to deal with his feelings about institutions and put them, to, put them to clinical and human use at a level that was unprecedented. Now, this, I, I once told Alvin that, Alvin Samrat, that I had figured out what he was doing. I was, writing, I was writing this first book called Approaches to the Mind, and I had figured out that he was an existentialist. He was in the great tradition of Binswanger, 
and others. And, um, and he looked at me in his quiet and forgiving way and said that well, perhaps he did, but he didn't know what existentialism was. And, uh, and, uh, and I explained in my wonderfully professorial didactic fashion what it was, and he said that was interesting. And we had this discussion for six or eight months, and I think he got bored with it and certainly tired of it. And, uh, and so he said to me, he said, Leston, um, just do me one favor, would you? Don't tell them downtown. <laughs> and though those of you who don't know the geography of Boston, downtown meant Commonwealth Avenue where the Boston Institute had its, had its location. But in the course of writing that book, I, um, I also began to unconscious of it at the time, but again develop the theme that I'm, I'm uh, burdening you with tonight, which was that who people are is probably the central aspect of how they work. And um, when I had finished understanding Kreplin, Emil Kreplin's contribution to psychiatry, which was immense, because you see today its dominance of, cl of clinical work everywhere, all over the world. When I had been, after finished studying him, I realized that, that he was a genius, a curious kind of genius, but he was a genius of the eye, E-Y-E. -E. He could, in his long experience in German communities, many of which he was a professor in, he, he was able to sketch patterns of behavior and appearance that are still detectable today. He had an extraordinary eye. And, and he set those patterns up in the various categories that you and I are so familiar with every day. And then there's Freud. What was Freud good at? Well, I mean, he was good at many things, but he was extraordinary. He was an extraordinary intellect. I mean, the, and, what a, what, and he had this extraordinary idea that if he listened into his, his busy and capacious mind would come all these associative materials and out of his mouth or out of his pen would come this stream of extraordinary writings, of original ideas, of things which had changed the whole shape and culture of the world. He had, he had if Kriplin had a great eye, here was a great, here was one of the great intellects. And then there were the existentialists, who overflowed with feeling, with understanding of the other's life, who wanted to share, to be part of, to even live with the patients and make sure that they knew the person, not intellectually, but understood them in the sense of being able to share, empathize, and be part of their lives. Here was a, here was a great development of the heart, if you like. And what was Sullivan? What was Sullivan good at? Now, some of you will be offended when I say this, but I really think Sullivan's mastery of, was of the hand, of the hand, H-A-N-D. And... Uh, and have you, have, you, have, you, have you noticed how often clinicians use their hands? Have you, have, you, have you talked with them? Have you noticed the way that they almost try to shape the discussion and the dialogue with their hands? So the hand is, very, is a very fundamental instrument of our understanding, as we need not forget. And of course, it's represented in words like management or manipulation. Manus, hand. And, he, and one of the things that I've been criticized very harshly, sometimes by some people from here, uh, in, in, in the counter-projection, was it sounded like a manipulation, even though it's an empathic manipulation. It sounded like a manipulation. He didn't like that. Even though Sullivan would have replied, if he'd, been, if he'd agreed with me, Sullivan would, have, <laughs> Sullivan would have replied, it's a counter-manipulation. The, the, the pathology shapes the situation in an impossible form. You have to correct it before a discussion can take place. He would argue that. So I think, here, the, here we are. Geniuses of the eye, the mind, the heart, the hand. Of course, the conclusion of the book was the implication, which I was wise enough not to press too far, that um, if we did our work, if we did our work, we would have all available to us, right? But I wouldn't be such a fool as to think for a moment that was even possible because we're all specialists and our characters are such that as they develop we're not likely to be very good at very much. And, uh, and so that although we might, we might like to use all those things, we might like to, we don't even know how to think that way yet, how we would talk that way. So we still have this very sectarian uh, cl uh, clinical situation as we all know so well. 
Now, there's another implication that I, I uh, in this that I've been very interested in myself from a personal point of view, and that's the case where the strength is not in the therapist. The strength is in the patient, where the patient bores from within, enters your life. And this, and this seems to me a much more common thing than, uh, than is acknowledged. <coughs> I don't want to keep you awake all night here, but the, um, if I'm keeping, I won't probably be able to keep you all awake anyway. But the, um, <coughs> I have a patient <coughs> who came to me because she was largely mute, and the only, only motion she gave of life, really, besides walking in and walking out, was, was that she writhed. She writhed. And at the same time, I, as I got to know her, I sensed that, that she was a very sensitive person, very easily offended, very self-critical, and that in most social situations she was profoundly uncomfortable, including with me. I, um, I, also, I also, for a good many years now, have been tantalized by Einstein's account of his development of general relativity, which you may know. <coughs> Einstein reported that, in a letter to a friend of his, that the first inkling he had of what was the matter with Newton, or Newton's kinetics, Newton's physics, the first inkling he had was that when he thought hard, this is Albert Einstein now, please, Albert Einstein, thinking very hard about Newtonian mechanics, right, finds that he's writhing. He found that his body and emotion was uncomfortable for him. And... Uh, in, one, in a later remark, which I haven't been able to find the origin of, I found the letter, but I didn't find this remark. Someone told me about this, that Einstein reported that it took him 25 years to translate those writhings into the differential equations of general relativity. Now that, that impressed me greatly. And uh, so I didn't dismiss my patient's writhing as catatonia, which it might be, nevertheless. But I wondered what might be making her so uncomfortable. What had she noticed, like Einstein, that was wrong in the social world around her that made her writhe and speechless? Well, I, <clears throat> I followed two of my teachers, one of whom, of course, is Freud, who told us that we should exercise an evenly harboring attention on many occasions. I did my best with that. Then I, <clears throat> then I remembered a, a famous remark of another person I regard highly, Robert Frost, Frost, you know, used to teach at Dartmouth, and he, and he, but he was very seldom in the classroom, and it was hard to find him. <laughs> and uh, he was so prestigious that they didn't try to lock him up in the classroom, but he, they did occasionally find him, and they find him, for example, wandering in the woods by himself. And on one occasion, it's reported, he was asked what he was doing, <laughs> perhaps by an assistant dean or something. <laughs> And the poet responded, I am waiting for something to occur to me. <laughs> now that, that, for me, was extraordinarily interesting. And, but I try, and, that, and I made that, a, made that a principle of my own clinical work. I want something to occur to me. In other words, I want something to occur to me that seems to come out of my being in relationship to this other person that's spontaneous and that I can tell it is like, it might be present if I find myself saying it. Not thinking about it, but just saying it. So I used those methods, and, and I, had a, I had a big help from the fact that <clears throat> my patient taught poetry to children. And in her teaching of poetry to children, she was without these writhings and, and was, could speak. And, and what I hypothesized was that in, those, in that relationship, she was comfortable, that, that she could bring her interest in teaching poetry to children was to have them make spontaneous gestures of their own, to have the kind of things occurring to them that, that, uh, that Frost might have been referring to himself. And so I tried to give her, in our relationship, something that she was able to establish herself in relationship to the children. And I was very clumsy, and it took a long time, and, and, but she bore up nobly with me. And eventually, I, we, we made a relationship in which we could make each other comfortable. And... Um, now, this required my having to do something. Here's the, bo the patient's boring from within. I had to overcome my philistinism, my stereotypic thinking, my 
foolishness of heart, you know, and realized that she was much more sensitive than I was. That she had an enormous sensitivity and sense of reality of social, the real social. She had no no patience at all. In fact, she was she was writhed in the presence of what we call social speech. And I had to do something about that myself. Now here was a case where the difficulty wasn't in the patient. The difficulty was in the therapist. And the therapist had to find some kind of way to be able to, to accept, to honor, to contact this gift this extraordinary woman had who's gone on. She'd been hospitalized off and on, but has gone on to get a doctorate in, at, the, in, at Harvard and to uh, teach, be a greatly sought teacher of poetry to children. And her gift is plain enough to see and now is, to some large measure, has been accepted in the world at large. And she doesn't ride at least not in my presence, and then I, I, from, I know one friend of hers who says she doesn't at all anymore. Now here's an instance where, <clears throat> where I'm reminded of one of my favorite Gandhi remarks. Because um, it seems to me that Gandhi's remark on this occasion speaks exactly to what I, I was so slow, but did in fact a little bit anyway do. You remember the great man, <clears throat> the great man was once challenged by one of his disciples with a list of things that people ought to do, that the ways the world ought to change, the things that were the matter with the world, and that the Mahatma ought to get up on his high horse and do something about them. And apparently after he listened to this insufferable stuff for a long time, the Mahatma looked at the man and said, you, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. You must be the change you wish to see in the world. Well, I thought that was the lesson of that patient experience, that I had to be the change. If the patient was, if the work was to go forward, I had to be the change, right? If the work was to proceed. And until I did change, it would be very difficult indeed for anything to happen. Well, here we, I'm, I'm, I don't know, how long am I supposed to, it's now, it's almost, almost nine o'clock. Could I talk for 10 minutes? <laughs> I, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> Now, one of the one of the problems with this whole presentation is, I'm no doubt you've detected well, only one of the problems. But one of the big problems is that is that uh, what am I talking about? I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's it's all very well, to, but what are we? What am I talking about? I mean, who 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 you are? What is that? You know. Well, I do think that for all our crudity of our ideas, that we do have, we do have some thoughts about that. Uh, whether we speak of individuality or selfhood or um, the emergence of a person or true self, we, there's something like that that, that gets closer to, to who we are, what we mean by the expression of who we are. Huh? I, I don't know whether you enjoyed as much as I did. I hope you enjoyed it. I saw it anyway. I hope you enjoyed it too. The, uh, the movie As Good As It Gets. Because that's a movie about this talk. Probably a much more interesting <laughs> talk than this one. Anyway, it, uh, in the movie, you remember, it opens as one of the early scenes has a little dog in it, a, a very cute little dog, and, 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 an, and an honorable dog. I mean, that's one of the points. I mean, the dog knows its own mind, enjoys itself, speaks up. And there's a wonderful scene later in the movie when there's a question of who the dog is now loyal to, right? And the former person that wanted to keep the loyalty of the dog br tries to bribe the dog with bacon of some kind, which is apparently a favorite thing of this dog, and the dog does not take it. So now here was somebody who could really, you know, could resist transformation <laughs> in, a, uh, in a splendid way. And then there's that scene in the, in, with the painter. Remember the painter is, instructs his subjects how they should act if they're going to be painted by this painter. And uh, the uh, painter says, well, I'll just keep moving around the apartment. And then when, I'll tell you when to stop. And then when he sees something he thinks characteristic of the person, what, what Winnicott would call a spontaneous gesture, he says, stop, now I know what I want to paint. So that's a second part of the theme of selfhood that this movie adumbrates. But the most wonderful part, of course, is poor Nicholson, Jack Nicholson. Jack Nicholson, you remember, is, is presented as a sort of a, you know, in DSM-4, uh, OCD, Tourette 
Case, who's marvelously uh, hostile to everything, every race, every person, every he tries to stuff that dog down the garbage chute with the, with the instruction, this is the way to learn about New York. You know? <laughs> we Bostonians could enjoy that press more than you could. <clears throat> but in the course of this movie, as you know, uh, Nicholson falls in love with the wonderful Helen Hunt. And he realizes when he has what, it, what, what I don't know what you call it, a date, exactly what happened went on between them, but something they'd get together and, and it'd be an agony because he, was, he would do his Tourette thing and insult her or he'd make some awful comment. And it, was, it was just dreadful. But he was struggling not to do that. He even, got, he even finally went to the doctor and took some medicine, which helped him some. And, but he was having a terrible time, you know, being something more than this caricature of a person that the Tourette thing represented. And it's a, I thought it was a marvelous poem because it, was, it wasn't very romanticized. You're not at all sure he can do it. <laughs> but he also, it all the movie also does the nice thing of noticing that Helen Hunt has also got her own problem. She's a terrible romantic. She's been looking for a man that would be normal, you know. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, there's, a great, there's a great scene on a staircase where she's looking at Nicholson and she says to him, good God, why can't I find a normal man? And her mother, who's living with her for some reason, comes out of the kitchen and says, how long will you wait for that? You know? Or something to that effect. You know, you, know, you remember Madame de Stael's famous remark about dogs and men? You know that one? The more I see of men, the more I like dogs. You know? <laughs> And there is that opposition in the, in the movie. <laughs> well, you know our ideas about selfhood. They're pretty primitive, but they're, they're useful. The, uh, there's a great deal...